All right. Uh, hi, my name is Mitch Kramer, and joining me is Mike Lanise, the portfolio manager for uh, Fluent Financial. This is our monthly guide to the markets, and this is our quarter in uh, mar uh, report. And this is normally a little longer than our other months because there's a lot more information and data because a lot of the, the companies we get information from produce really good data on a quarterly basis. And today we're going to be talking about um, the September swoon. And a lot of you know that September historically has always been the worst month of the year for the stock market. And this month uh, proved to be right in line with the others. We'll talk a little bit about the inflation. We have very minimal uh, discussion on COVID. So the people that don't want to hear about it, it's actually good news what we are going to talk about. We'll and talk about the supply chain um, and also the impact of rising interest rates and, and how dead the bond market is. It's, it's kind of like the land of the zombies and then cash. So it's, it's becoming very difficult for people who have traditional portfolios. You guys have seen the dead T-Rex we put on our 60-40 bond slide. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. And the first thing I wanna talk about is that um, Mike does a great job every Monday morning. He puts together a weekly market update, he talks about economic conditions, what's going on in the markets, any significant Fed meetings, uh, government policy changes that will impact your portfolio. You can click this, this subscribe button uh, to view the videos, and then you can hit this little bell button up here on the right-hand side to uh, be notified when there's a new one uh, available. So Mitch, I, I just want to add to that. We, we uh -huh. try the best we can to do it on Mondays, um, but like this week, we didn't put one out. We had um, getting ready for this presentation. We had options expiration. So um, we try to put it out every Monday, everybody. So for those of you that do follow that and count on that for your market news, I apologize that it's not a little more consistent. Yes. Well, I think you went to the mm -hmm. fair one Monday, so I, I don't think that that, that was mm -hmm. nice. Anyway, uh, I think we had a record number of people went to the fair this year. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Mike, uh, mm -hmm. why don't you kind of talk about what's been going on in the markets and the key insights? OK, so hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, signing in. Mm -hmm. And this is just a quick snapshot of where we started pre-COVID mm -hmm. and what the markets have done. So if you look, obviously, NASDAQ in the purple has, has kind of led the way. Um, I like to put both the S&P and the S&P equal weighted on there because those things have ebbed and flowed at various times. And you see they are, they are coming together now, the red and the white line. And then you can see the Dow Jones average is lagging a little bit. But they just kind of already covered what we were going to be looking at today. Um, so those are just some highlight bullet points there. And um, Mitch, I think... Um, I think we can uh, go go to the next mm. slide if possible. Okay. Okay. Mm. So per performance by quarter. Um, if you look down, really, what I want you guys to mm. take a look at. I know there's a lot of data on this slide, but if you look at the far right hand side mm. of this slide, um, that's our year to date, 2021, and the S and P is about midway there, showing up about 19 mm. percent. Um, that's up a little bit more than that right now. And then you can go down to the second to the last on the bottom right, and you see that um, our portfolio is up almost 3% higher than the S&P. And a lot of that has to do with, with the energy. We're a little bit heavier in energy, and energy has done well on the recent dip, and we'll address that here as we move forward. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about you know some specific stocks in our portfolio, Mike. Yeah. So. Um, what you see in front of you is 50% of our V&O portfolio, that white line at the top. And um, it's up 21, uh, little, uh, almost 22% versus the S&P up 19% through, through October, like we saw in that last slide. But these are some of the, the, um, the names that are, that are moving us higher. Um, so you, you would expect your energy names to be there. ConocoPhillips is leading the way there. But also some of your some of your big Google Microsoft names and financials. We think financials are going to continue to do well, and as we continue to trim oil, as oil keeps going higher, uh, financials is definitely one of the places we're going to continue to move money. And you see that Intuit does the does the tax software a lot of people use, um, S and P Global, the S and P Index. So um, and Home Depot Home Depot is up a lot higher than where it is right. 
right now on this slide because this slide was done through last Friday and Home Depot has really made a nice jump mm -hmm. since then. Okay. And now let's talk a little bit about September mm -hmm. and the seven month winning streak that was uh, uh, snapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so September is uh, is typically a tough month as you can see through, through, the, uh, through the averages here. And um, mm -hmm. Mitch, what did we did we say it was down um, uh, five percent? Is that about what we five percent for September? Yeah, so it was down about five percent, and um, our stock portfolio during that time was down less than two percent. So we we definitely did not feel the full impact mm -hmm. of that, and that has to do with with um, our energy holdings, but as well as some of our other holdings. Um, we are mm -hmm. trying to pick stocks that we think will will weather the storm. Uh, rather than the stocks that will have thousand point gains. And so um, I think when you're in value stocks like that, they tend to do better when markets take a dip. Okay. And let's talk about the 5% drawdown of 2021. All right. So you typically have somewhere between like three and six, 5% drawdowns in a year. That's, that's pretty normal. We are just now having our first drawdown nine months into the year. Mm -hmm. And what this chart here is showing is for the developed markets mm -hmm. globally, um, having their first 5.44% mm -hmm. pullback uh, from September 6th is, is when it started. And mm -hmm. then if you go to the next slide, Mitch, it'll sh I mm -hmm. talked a little bit more about the S&P. The S&P, was the dip was September 3rd through October 4th. And during that time period, the S&P fell 5.21%. And I highlighted a couple things on here um, to show you guys. So what, what I wanna show you is, if you look at the S&P 500 in the top left of the graph here, you see that it was up through uh, September 2nd. Uh, Mitch, left-hand side, right above the, the first yellow highlight there, 20.79% is where the S&P hit its peak so far this year. Now we're hitting new peaks. But um, if you go down to the, to the V&O in the bottom left portion, during that 21% run-up, V&O, our stock portfolio, went up about 19.5%. So if you look at the next to the right of that, it says we captured 93.75, so almost 94% of the upside in the in the s p 500 and the why i'm showing you guys this is when you're investing in a portfolio you want to get as much upside as possible and minimize the downside so if we follow the s p line across whoa there we go so if you follow the s p line across at the top on that drawdown you see a negative 5.21 percent go down to where the vno stocks are and you see that we were down negative 2.08 percent i'm not i'm not trying to highlight that we're down two percent because you don't want to ever be down but it's it's kind of the nature of the business but to the right of that it says that we captured just under 40 percent of that downside the furthest column to the right is your up down capture ratio anything over one means that we are capturing more upside than downside and that's actually the significance of this slide. So when you look at that VNO is up, the ratio is 2.35. So we're capturing 2.35 of the upside versus the downside. Stock income is also over one. If you look at bonds, um, that second bullet point kind of highlights the bonds. Bonds have been really rough. So you use bonds as a hedge. When the stock market goes up, bonds typically go down. When the stock market goes down, bonds typically go up. What we've seen in this up run and then the pullback, we've seen bonds go down during the stock up run, and then bonds are down again on the stock pullback. So they've really been beaten up. And, and Mitch and I have been saying this for months and months now that 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 60-40 bond portfolio is very difficult. It's not what it was 10 years ago. And and bonds are really struggling to perform and give people a um, let me remind everybody, those of you there on your computer, you can be muted, but those of you that are calling in to please uh, keep background noise to a minimum. So I appreciate your cooperation. Thank you. 
Yeah, we're hearing some sort of feedback from someone. So mute those phones, please. All right. Um, okay, Mitch. So um, let's talk about the different, the different uh, sectors in September and what happened here. So if you look, everything was down except oil. And yes, we are energy heavy still. So that, that's one of the main reasons why we were able to pad a lot of those losses during September. Hmm. Mitch, you want to go on to the next slide? And I posted something, uh, I, I posted this chart on LinkedIn. Trey, our assistant portfolio manager, created uh, or pulled this slide from Fidelity. And what you are seeing here, the, the black line is what the markets have been doing this year. And if you look at the pink, the pink is the normal seasonality of the stock market by month on a, on a weekly basis each month. That's your pink line and the up and down. And if you notice, since 1900, it is very normal to have a pullback in September and October before we hit what we call the Santa Claus rally and that run up into Christmas. And I, I just wanted people to see that, to post that, because when you see these dips, you're like, oh no, is, is, is the run over? This is very normal. And I think something to remain calm about. Yeah. And then let's talk in more detail, Mike, about the different year-to-date returns by segment. Yeah. And again, commodities is leading and energy is a big part of that commodity sector there at the top. And right below it is, is U.S. large cap. And we are in the U.S. large cap, uh, large, large cap stocks. Um, but that that growth sector is going to be your FANG stocks, where you know, like your Amazons, Microsoft, Netflix. Um, whereas the regular U.S. large cap are going to be more value. Value is a couple of rungs down from growth there. So growth is outperforming a little bit um, overall. But the takeaway from this slide is down towards the bottom where all the bonds are. Bonds, emerging markets, and international developed markets. Bonds are just really, really struggling this year. And uh, and and the and the emerging markets, the uh, developed international is is positive on the year, but it's lagging everything but high yield bonds right now um, in the U.S. market. So that that foreign sector, we have we have these portfolios or ETF portfolios where it is necessary to diversify between both foreign and domestic markets, um, developed markets, and bonds versus stocks. And so when you see some of those portfolios are dragging the S and P. And these are the reasons why. Yeah, and, and we've been underweight international for quite some time, and that's actually been a, a, a benefit to the people on this call. And we've talked about bonds a great deal. And I think this next slide does a really good job explaining why the bonds are just not a great place to be. So, right, so as of this slide, which took us through September 30th, so right now it's, it's December 21st, three weeks later, through September 30th, Bonds have had were ranked as their eighth worst start of a year ever. Mitch, I looked this up um, today where we finished through yesterday, and that negative 1.6 number is negative 2.8, which puts this instead of the eighth worst start, we're sitting just below the third worst start of the year at negative 2.8 percent. Yeah, we're just so, off the podium. Let's say it again. We're just off the podium. Yep, exactly. Exactly, win, win, play, show here. Um, yeah. So and bonds then, are struggling, everybody. Yeah, and then what's even worse, the longer duration or the longer term a bond has before you have to pay it, the worse it's done. And as you can see on this slide here, Mike, you know, it's below 3% for the first time in 53 years. Now, the, if there's a good good spin to this slide, the the, the, the price for mortgages is significantly low and Americans, unlike our government, have been paying down their debt or refinancing it. So anything you want to add here? That, that orange box I think is really important. 23% of all 10-year bond returns are less than 3% average annual return. Last time it happened was April 1968. So think about that. A 10-year bond, the average, if you're getting less than 3%, on every million dollars, you're getting less than thirty thousand dollars on that million million dollar investment. Yeah, and so you're getting that. Then what's the current inflation rate right now? Well, 
it, it's it's six percent, you know, six six and change. Yeah. Um, it, we're going to talk about sticky versus versus not sticky inflation here in a couple of minutes. Yeah, and you can see two different types of inflation we're dealing with. Yeah. So to continue on the fixed income and cash problem, this next slide it shows you uh, the income you earn on hundred thousand dollars. And would you the blue lines here represent the income needed to beat inflation? And really, since the Great Recession, you cannot get enough income on a savings account to pay or get ahead of inflation. But what's what what you can notice here, look at because of the inflation jump that we've had recently, it takes four thousand dollars just to get ahead, and cash is paying you. On $100,000, $70. So people that are very conservative, a lot of people that are, that are older, maybe you know, the greatest generation um, are scared of the markets. These people are having to eat principal just to pay their bills, and they're scared to death they're going to run out of money before they run out of life. So this is a very, very scary predicament for a lot of people, a lot of Americans. I wanted to put this in perspective that if we have a lot of people on this call that are in that are in our advantage portfolio and our stock income portfolio where we target 0.8 and one uh, percent a month of, of cash generation so that that current rate right there of, of about four thousand dollars a year if for adv that's ninety two hundred dollars a year or ninety six hundred dollars a year and for our stock income portfolio it's more like twelve thousand dollars a year yeah, it's a good point. And that's and that's what we've been building since 2013 by using options to generate income without having to uh, get in the principal as heavily. Uh, we're going to change gears. We have just two very quick slides on COVID. Um, there's a lot of data here, but the thing I want you to focus on, everything is coming down, the exception the United Kingdom is having a little bit of a spike up in cases. Um, but overall, everything is is coming down. And hopefully we're seeing, you know, the, the final lap uh, for COVID and the Delta variant. There probably will be subsequent other variants, Epsilon, Gamma. I guess we'll go through the Greek alphabet like the hurricanes. But um, the bottom line is you're, a lot more people are getting vaccinated. And, and a lot of people who've had it have better immunity than getting a vaccine. And, and we're proponents of, you know, getting the vaccine if it's appropriate for you. You obviously talk to your doctor. But COVID is uh, starting to end, which is something we've hoped for. This next slide talks a little bit about um, where we are in the United States. If you look at this, the graph here on the right, it vaccinated only is olive, infected and vaccinated is the gray. You have the breakthrough cases here. Then you have an infected only, so the natural immunity. But if you cross here, we're about 80 something percent. And Fauci, whether you, you think he's a, a saint or the devil, um, you know, he, 80 percent is herd immunity. So that doesn't mean that people won't get sick. I mean, we still have uh, quite a few people getting COVID, but the therapeutics and the treatments are more are, are better known. Uh, so I think we're going to get back to normal. And, and one of the downsides of COVID has been the whole supply chain uh, implication, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about you know the, some of the economic parts and some of the profitability. The uh, stock market has gone up quite a bit. A lot of it's to do with the liquidity, but the other part of it is companies have been able to raise their prices. And if you look at the earnings per share growth, look at this margin, 64 percent. That's the largest it's been in 20 years. So companies have been able to raise prices. And their yeah, their revenue is up too, so it's up you know pretty solidly. But the margin, and that has a lot to do for the market increasing. Because a lot of people say, well, Mitch is the market overvalued. You know, the PE ratios are high. And I said, well, be patient. We actually talked about this in prior webinars, and what we were talking about is the P, the PE ratio. And again, that's stock price over earnings. It's, it's a fraction, and the price went up, but the earnings were not there. So you had this big spike up. Now the earnings are coming in, so the denominator is getting bigger and the PE ratio is coming down. So the market's more fa fairly valued now than it was this summer because of the earnings component. But there's going to be some challenges. We're not trying to say that, you know, that it's, it's sunny outside and we're in great shape. There are some concerns. So, Mike, why don't you talk about some of the, the headwinds we're going to be facing? Yes, sir. Thanks, Mitch. 
Yeah, so, so again, like he said, might not be easy sailing going forward, uh, slowing revenue growth. So, is, so here's some concerns that we're gonna have with these headwinds. Slowing revenue growth, accelerating wages as people are trying to get, you know, you, you see it all over the restaurants are trying to get people to come in and work and they keep raising their prices, keep raising the prices of their wages. They can't get people to show up. Rising input costs, supply chain disruptions, and possibly higher corporate taxes that are being proposed by this current presidential administration. We're not sure what is going to pan out on that. I think it's um, suffice. So I like to, yeah, I think suffice to say taxes are going to go up for a lot of people, um, and we don't know what's going to come out of D.C. And a lot of people ask me, "Well, Mitch, what do you think of this tax proposal, this or that?" And I, I basically tell people. I'm not going to speculate until the law is written because I don't want somebody to say, well, you said back last fall this could happen or this would happen. I said, no, I said it could happen. I don't want to muddy the water. So we'll, we may even do a special webinar, uh, not during the month, but just independent of our normal one, just to talk about the impact of the new tax laws and how it affects you. But Mike, um, you talked about supply chain uh, disruptions. Yeah. Let's talk about these container ships and problems off our coast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a snapshot of the Port of Los Angeles, uh, Long Beach, Los Angeles, um, and the San Francisco, Oakland Bay area. Container ships coming through there, I don't know how many people on this call know this, but 40% of our imports come from those two parts of, of, our, of our coastline, and they are very backed up right now. Um, the, the latest I heard this morning uh, was 157 cargo ships. I put 156 on this slide when I made it, but there's 157 cargo ships just waiting to unload, and you have even more outside of, of the New York Harbor. And uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, is proposing just 24-7 unloading of these cargo, um, of these cargo containers. But what's crazy about that is even if they unload them, they don't have the truck drivers to move the materials. Off the and so you're, yep. Yeah, so you're seeing this backlog. Um, uh, Mitch, truck drivers that are under 21 can't cart cargo across state lines. And Congress is, is I, I think they're trying to address the issue, but there's, there's silly things like that that, that are causing a, a shortage of workers and are causing this big backup. Huh. I wonder if this is a Chinese sub here in red. I guess it's a tanker anyway. All right. So let's All right. continue on the supply chain. Yeah. So um, so so one of the things these these uh, transportation costs. Um, so one one of the issues that is happening is the price of these shipping containers. Price of shipping containers right now are ten times where they were uh, twenty four months ago. So two years ago. And if you're trying to ship goods and you have pretty thin profit margins and you're paying 10 times the cost of a shipping container, that's really gonna pinch people. We know what's going on with energy and the gas prices going up. Natural gas prices surge over 700% in the UK and they're about to hit um, a, a tight energy supply this winter. So we expect energy prices to continue to go higher as, uh, as as the supply continues to try to be met by OPEC, doesn't seem like uh, this administration is allowing the U.S. to meet our supply needs. Well, um, well, you know, our president approved the Russian pipeline for natural gas to Europe, and Putin's basically uh, throwing his weight around for our European friends, and he may not ship as much gas as what's needed. But again, we also then we killed our Keystone pipeline, so we know where our priorities are. Uh, yep. Oh. Um, Semiconductor chips, if anybody's heard about um, the, the car shortage, people, you know, computer chips go in everything, refrigerators, cars, dishwashers, anything these days. And uh, there's definitely a supply uh, chip shortage coming out of Taiwan and South Korea. And um, I don't expect that to be a quick turnaround. We'll probably see that pinch at least through 2021 into 2022. Um, but one of the things that I've been hearing people talk about is this supply chain bottleneck once it clears out it's going to be a supply glut and you're going to see the prices come back down so for those of you that are stockpiling i, I wouldn't get too panicky about any, any sort of supply chain issues right now 
Yeah, I think that the, the, the big issue that's facing everybody on this call is the inflation. So we're going to talk a little bit about some inflationary pressures now. Yeah, so where is inflation coming from? And as expected, we've seen energy prices really take off from, uh, from the floors of summer of last year. And if you look on this chart, the, the jagged line is gonna be your transitory inflation that we have previously talked about. Used cars, rentals, vehicle insurance, lodging, airfares, food away from home. And we said that that was gonna be transitory. And that is a, a peer, appears to be what's happening. But your energy inflation is sticking around and that's that white portion of the far right bar that we're seeing. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit now about sticky versus flexible inflation. Yes, okay. So, so when you guys hear the news about temporary inflation, they've been calling it transitory inflation. And there's gonna be sticky inflation and transitory inflation. In this slide, we call it flexible inflation. So sticky inflation right now is up about 2.6%. That includes your rent, your owner's equivalent rent, so if you own your home and you pay a monthly mortgage, that's owner's equivalent rent, insurance costs and medical expenses. Those are not going to probably drop down as quickly as something like uh, uh, transitory inflation or flexible inflation. Right now, that's spiking very high. That's up 14, um, just about 14%, which is the highest since the 1970s. And that's gonna be your things such as food, energy, and cars. Again, we expect to see that through the rest of the year, but expect that also to come down in 2022. Yeah. Um, so how, how do the stocks and bonds perform in an inflationary environment? Yeah, this is a really neat slide because inflation, you hear about it, it can be scary. But if you look at this chart on the bottom there, it shows different inflationary rates. And it's not until you get above 6% inflation that both stocks and bonds, so stocks are gonna be dark blue, bonds are gonna be light blue for the various inflation, um, inflation rates there. And you see above 6% is where people really start to get hit. And if you remember that previous slide, we talked about the temporary inflation being 14%, and that's gonna drop back down. We would imagine that's gonna drop back down pretty quickly you find yourself in the sticky inflation, which is around that 2.6 level, that circle on the left, the larger red circle, shows equity still doing about 14% return when you have a, a two to 3% inflation, and the sticky inflation right now is sitting around 2.6%. So um, my point to you guys is we don't feel that there is a need to stress about inflation at this time. Yeah, and, and this is where Mike and I may differ a little bit on this next slide, um, the key, one of the key sticky elements that um, was not on the prior slide is wage growth. And the 50 year average for wage, wage growth is 4%. And that's this dotted blue line right here. And we haven't been at 4% since 2007. And you can see the spike here during COVID, it's come back down, but now it started to, to track back up. It's at 4.9. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, or more than a couple reasons. One is you have a lot of baby boomers who are exiting the workforce, the houses have appreciated, the market's done well, they hit their number, they're done. Um, two, you have uh, a lot of people that were giving uh, government stimulus checks and there was no desire to work, so the employers had to pay more money to get, get people to work. And then th three, our economy has been growing and when you have a growing economy, you need to hire people or you can't continue to grow your company as quickly as you would like. So those factors have pushed this up and wage growth historically has been one of the main reasons you have sticky inflation. But what you can see is you have this wage growth that occurs after recessions. So this is somewhat common and we did come out of this recession. You can see this big spike up, unemployment rate came back down almost as quickly like a you know, Bezos rocket. Um, so this is something we're going to pay very close attention to, and hopefully this does not create more permanent or sticky inflation. So the next thing I want to talk about, I, I mentioned the Bullio brothers, Alan and Brian, who talk about um, they're very good at predicting economic cycles. 
and they have a really good quarterly update. It's a very long report. They've written some really good books. I subscribe to their their uh, news story or their um, their material. And the next few slides are going to be very similar in terms of the layout. So I'm going to kind of go through and tell you guys what you're looking at. What they do is they look at the, the different um, economic sectors of the economy in phases. So phase A is recovery. So this is coming out of recession. It's blue. B is your accelerating growth, which is green. Slowing growth is you kind of slow the growth slows down as orange or this yellow color, and recession is red. So you look at the core U.S. economy, and these numbers are, are rolling 12 months, and the the headlines up here represent what will they'll be at the end of the calendar year. So this is 1231, and what you'll see is we're going to have pretty phenomenal growth throughout the rest of 21. Growth is going to slow in 22. 23, growth is going to pick back up. I think what you're going to see here in the first quarter of 22 is going to be a slight pause as we try, we, as we transition from a uh, the supply shortage to a supply surplus, and we kind of digest it in 23, we get back to more of a normal trend. But really, everything in this sector looks pretty solid. So let's go take a look at the financial economy on the next slide. And the, and the Bolio brothers don't like to predict what's going to happen with the stock market. You know, current 12-month period is really solid. Uh, they said the September decline was expected, but they don't see a bear market in this cycle. So when you say this cycle, they're going out to 23. So they don't anticipate a bear market until 23. And what they've talked about is the next recession will begin in sometime in 25, all of 26, in part of 27, it's going to be a more severe recession, probably similar to 2002 or 08 and 09. But there's really nothing they see on the horizon that's going to put us there. Now, a comment that a lot of people who, who talk with us, you guys have seen this, is I'm very concerned what happens if the Winter Olympics take place and what China does with Taiwan because Xi has, has gone on the record and said, we want to unify with Taiwan. He wants to have that to be his crown jewel of his reign. Um, and if they go after Taiwan militarily, what are we going to do? I don't know, but they could have a negative impact. We talk about the semiconductor shortage. China has the same problem. So why not try to absorb uh, the, you know, Formosa or, the, you know, form, or Taiwan back into the home country so that's the, something to wait and see but in terms of the in terms of prices um, we don't see significant increase you see it here but it's dropping down the more lower levels for inflation but again the wage growth is going to be a big part of that um, the next part is you look at the global economy very similar color structure as you've seen on the prior slides you know solid growth uh, for you know last 12 months and then for 21 kind of a slower growth in 22 than picking back up in uh, 23 uh, from around around the world. Their growth hasn't been as strong as, as ours has been. Um, I just think our country overall did a much better job of handling COVID than a lot of our peers. Now, granted, you know, a lot of people have died because of it, but our economy is in much better shape compared to uh, Asia and Europe and Africa and South America. Um, the manufacturing report, um, this has got a little more color on it because it's many, many more sectors. But again, you still see the common trend, you know, basically green now, green at the end of the year, more yellow here. Defense goods, you know, the recession at the end of 22, if China and Taiwan go to war, maybe this will change to, you know, green. Um, and civilian aircraft recession at the end of 23. But everything else is, is showing grow or going to be accelerating growth here. So. There's really no what I would call yellow or red lights facing our economy. And what's kind of neat on this last chart of this grouping, um, imagine this slope is like a train track and financials and housing are the locomotives that are ahead of the train. And if you look at most of the sectors, they're in accelerating growth. Housing and financials are starting to turn over the slowing growth, non-residential construction. So this is probably your office buildings that a lot of them were people were working at home, that just starting to pick back up. And the Bolio brothers expect we're gonna have a soft landing as we get through 22 and then pick up the growth again. And then we'll see what happens in 24, 25, they're expecting more of a hard landing 
where we're going to have more of a severe recession. Um, so skipping and, that red, skipping that red uh, recessionary line on the yeah, soft landing. Yeah, on the soft landing. So we'll avoid that probably in 22, 23, uh, and 24 or you know 25. That's you know four years out. It's going to be hard to predict. A lot can happen. Um, and the next slide I want to share with you is you know there's been a, half the country thinks we're in horrible shape. They don't like what's going on with the current administration and, and uh, the, the conservatives and Republicans feel that way. The Democrats and liberals think things are probably OK, depending on what news you watch. And, and then when Trump was in office, it was reversed. But what I wanted to do here is show you something that is non-political. And this is a very powerful chart. You guys have seen this chart before. But if you look at household debt service ratio and when you look at this, you know, when it started in 1980, about 10.6 percent, that's dropped now to 8.5 percent. So unlike our government, we've been able to get our balance sheets in shape. And Americans as a group, we have one hundred forty four point five trillion dollars in net worth, which is an all time record high. Uh, so that's been very beneficial for for a lot of Americans, I'm not saying Americans are hurting. You know, the student loan debt is really hurting the millennial generation and then the Z generation that's following them. Colleges seem to charge whatever they want and people will pay it. Um, and, then, and then people comment, they say, well, Mitch, all this debt the government's running, is this going to really hurt our economy? And I said, well, maybe it will, but maybe it won't, because depending on where you get your news sources, our economy has had a tendency to grow uh, just about as fast as our debt has. And if you look at this chart here, this is um, federal net debt. So it's a percentage of GDP. And you had this you know, rapid increase here coming out of the Great Recession. We kind of leveled off a little bit. Then we had COVID hit. You had this big deficit spending for 20 and 21. And this is the predicted slope as we get out through the decades, uh, a decade of the 20s. But you don't see this hockey stick uptick and a lot of people don't focus on the fact the United States, we are very, very productive. We produce a lot of stuff and a lot of income and a lot of taxes so we can sustain this level of debt. And just to kind of put this in context, and you guys have seen me show the Japan slide in meetings, their debt to GDP is 260 percent. So we're, if you're, we're at 100 or 105, we're in much better shape. And Japan's the third largest economy in the world, very stiff immigration policies a very old aging population, birth rates 0.6. You know, the country's demographics are horrific. Now, the other part I want to share with you on this slide, and, and you guys know I'm, I'm not a big fan of our government. 48% um, of our income, uh, government spends of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Many people have said, well, Mitch, are they going to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid? I don't think that's going to happen because the people that are retired, vote more than any other group. And if either party decides to cut Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid, they're going to be voted out of office. So this is pretty safe. Some people say defense is safe. So there's another 14 percent. So it's 62. Then you've got the interest on your debt. You've got to pay. That takes us to 68. So 68 percent of our government spending is is basically fixed. It's not going to change. But then you ask, what are we spending 32 percent of their, our money on? And I call this the porky pig part of our government budget. And this is for projects and special interests and, you know, fill in the blank. This is the part that we really need to rein in. Um, unfortunately, our, our government, they need to have a, a seat at the kids table for Thanksgiving in the kitchen. But currently, our government thinks they need to be at the head of the table in the dining room and have business and the world revolve around them. Uh, this power grab is just it's just sickening. Um, but I do think we will we'll be able to get through this, uh, regardless of what gets passed uh, by the legislation. That 3.5 trillion to be over a 10-year period. It's not one year. Um, and, and again, I think the biggest concern is: are that taxes and regulations going to kill the animal spirits, which would really hurt growth? And that's probably the the, the big concern that I have. Um, so. As we kind of wrap up, and this is uh, you know kind of our, our our closing slide, we have eight portfolios we primarily manage, and three of our eight we write a lot of options. And advantage in my in 
uh, Mike had talked about, we're averaging, or we tell people nine, six or 80 basis points a month. Advantage Plus is half this and half our VNL, about half that in terms of income generation. Stock income is 10 stocks or right covered calls on those. So this is what we tell people we're going to generate. This is what we actually have done trailing 12 months. And we're going to show this slide you know, each month um, to kind of give you guys an update of what we're doing. Many of you guys are in you know, one or more of these portfolios. So that completes our presentation. I'll, I'll now uh, turn off the recording and open up uh, the mics for any Q&A.